we need to start thinking of emotions as actions we do in the body rather than sort of things that happen to us as if we were, you know, talk about somatic responsibility. And when someone says, you made me angry, for example, that's blatantly ridiculous because someone else could be in the same place with the same stimulus and not have the same emotional response. Like, let's say the music came on and you hated it and I loved it. Now, you know, music didn't make you angry and me happy. Like, we literally are the only ones who have had that response. And as we get older, we can have some control over that. We're not two-year-olds. And we can certainly learn skills to really fine-tune that, you know, to regulate ourselves, to manage those patterns. That's one way to work somatically. There are other ways to work. You know, we might actually need to express our anger or express it, learn to express it in a safe, controlled way. You know, it might be about boundaries and learning to get a solid no in our body so we then don't have to overcompensate with anger. So, you know, there's a posture we teach for embodied yoga principles, which is one of the methods I use. And you, people can Google that. They can see my beautiful Ukrainian wife. I, I wondered for a while while it was the most popular video. I think I figured it out. Welcome to Think Bigger, Think Better where we explore how you can apply insights from visionary leaders and the most provocative philosophers and scientists of our time to make your life and our world a better place. Here's your host, author and speaker, Paul Gibbons. Hey, and welcome back to Think Bigger, Think Better. Thanks for all the terrific feedback on our populism episode last week. In coming shows, we're going to have Massimo Biliucci, a fascinating guy, serial author and founder of the very big Rationally Speaking podcast. Then we are going to turn to evidence-based. What the hell does that mean? And how does it apply in medicine, management, and public policy? And then finally, we're going to talk to Steven Pinker about his new book on enlightenment. So keep listening and keep telling your friends. Thank you. Remember also to review the podcast on iTunes. It takes about 15 seconds, maybe less, maybe five. And then tell me you've done so in an email and I'll send you one of the author's books that we featured on the show. Today, we're going to talk about embodiment with one of the world's experts. His name is Mark Walsh. But let me give you a little pricey. So in contemporary psychology, who we are and how we grow, learn, and change are mental phenomena. In today's episode, we're going to look at a radical new view, the body and its role and change. You won't find this in textbooks. The ideas my guest Mark Walsh shares today are found in very few places, some workshops, some personal development courses, some philosophers, and even then in very, very few of those. So here's a trigger warning. Mark is uh, pure authenticity. So if you object to cussing, we get a little bit salty here and there. So before we start, what is embodiment? So one view of the body is that it's a brain taxi. It is there to keep alive and carry around the most important and interesting part of the self, which is the mind. This so dominates our view of the world today that anything other than that is seen as alien. The self, the personality, intelligence, the emotional life, all the things that you think about yourself, all of the things that people would use to describe you are mental. The body is separate. We might describe someone in bodily terms and the body has its own concerns. It has health concerns, medical concerns, aesthetic concerns. Sometimes we want a six pack. We want to be curved where we ought to be curved and we want to be flat where we want to be flat. But this separateness, the body as a health, medical, aesthetic domain, and the self, the mind, a separate mental domain, is really limited. By and large, this misses a trick. So take someone who's passionate. To embody this idea of passionate, say you're passionate about a subject, there's a physical aliveness in the eyes and the posture and the voice and the pace and tone. Say you want, as a leader to more passionately express your vision, then part of learning to do that will be bodily. You can't just think passionate, you need to embody passion. And then you'll need to work with the body correlates of the attributes of passion, not just the mental processes of being passionate. So embodiment affects the domains of learning and of self-regulation. So the question is for people interested in self-development and leadership development, how can your bodily practice help you develop the self 
or if you're in the gym or in your yoga class, your body is working and you're working on your body. But unless that working on your body is connected to bigger goals, like being more compassionate or being more passionate, it's separate. To be, say, more flexible in life or to have more stamina in life or more perseverance in life, you can connect those sorts of narratives with your physical practice. Embodiment isn't just concerned with behavior, but sort of a duh. If you want change, your body is going to have to do it. So just changing your mental life might be useful. You might be depressed. You might be anxious. But to have results in life, starting a business, starting a family, changing your behaviors, whatever they are, your behaviors have to follow your intentions. And here we are. That's a little pricey of the world of embodiment. If you're unfamiliar with this kind of thinking, it may seem strange. That's because it's novel and that's because it's countercultural. So have some patience and see what you can get from listening to Mark Walsh and I discuss this. Mark from England is a pioneer in what is called somatic or embodied education. He has studied with world leaders in this field, notably with Paul Linden, and synthesizes their work with contemporary best practice in adult learning. He runs not only corporate programs for the Global 100, but also works with communities in conflict zones. He teaches yoga and is an experienced martial artist. His current projects include his own podcast, The Embodiment Podcast, his YouTube channels, The Embodiment Channel. He's the CEO of Integration Training UK and The Embodied Yoga Principles. I'm going to put links to all of those in the show notes. And right now, let's welcome Mark. Welcome, Mark, to Think Bigger, Think Better. You take on a lot of stuff in life, and I want to start with, I guess, the thing that unites all of your stuff, right, is this idea of embodiment. Is that too naive a way of talking about what you do? Oh, that's, that's the central thing in all the many things that I do. All right, cool. Well, all right, let's tell people what is embodiment. What the hell is that? Yeah, this is the bane of my life is being at parties and uh, people say, what do you do? I am an embodiment teacher and I wish I was a fucking plumber at that point so people would know what I did. Um, so <laughs> <All right. laughs> there's many, many definitions. The simplest way is the study of how we are, how we are. So that's the three word definition in relationship to the body. So the idea here is the body is more than a brain taxi. The body is an integral part of who we are. So you can view the body as an object, as a piece of meat, and that you know there's advantages to that at certain times, like medically, for example. But also the body is a, has a subjective element. It's an aspect of our being, an aspect of who we are. Um, you know, in many ways, this this may sound very philosophical and abstract, but in many ways, this is common sense. You know, if you're in a particular mood. The world looks different, you think different, your relationships are different, that people have a way of being in the body which you can spot. You know, a child can spot it, a dog can spot it, spot it. Some people you cross the street to avoid. Sometimes you might just realize, you know, oh, wow, that person's in a really good mood. Maybe this is a, a good time to ask them for that thing or talk to them about politics or not. How we live in bodies as bodies is what embodiment's all about. And then you can also talk of it as a type of intelligence. So you can talk of it as involving skill sets such as body awareness, self-regulation, empathy, uh, leadership, uh, all embodied traits. I can dig into any of those if you're interested. And we could also look at it lastly as a way in which several fields have come together. So there, there's yoga, there's martial arts, there's improv comedy, there's body psychotherapy. There's all these different fields, about six major ones that work with the body uh, in a sort of depth psychological way rather than a kind of body or fitness way. So there's the difference they're embodied. And they're kind of coming together. And this really started on the started on the West Coast in the US in the 60s and started to come to some maturity in recent years where all these people started talking to each other. And it's like, okay, well, this field needs a name. So we can say, right, yeah, you've got one piece of the embodiment puzzle in yoga, but there's another piece in Aikido, another piece in tango. And how do we bring those all together? So that's really been my life's work obsession. You know, it's what I do, but uh, just about it's the end of a fr Friday afternoon here in England. I'm just about to go to London, spending my weekend doing yoga in London, meeting other embodiment people. I've really built a lot of community on and offline from this embodiment community. So yeah, there's a long answer. It's definitely the word uh, most associated with my work. Well, all right. Well, let's tear into it. So sometimes in common everyday speak, you'll hear people say, you've got to embody your values. Is that a, something that's, is that part of what you mean by embodiment? Yeah. 
there's a sort of literal and metaphorical version of that. I think it is a nice usage. And continuously in language, you'll see people intuitively pointing to the idea of embodiment. You know, they say that, that person's got backbone or he's a stand-up guy. You know, there's there's all this, always this intuitive pointing in language. And in this case, um, someone embodies something, you know, that could just mean they very literally, their behavior matches what they say, their values, that congruence. But it's also this sense that it goes deep, that it's who they are, not just what they do. So if we look at the level of being, it's like, you know, I'm, I, embodiment isn't just something I do. I'm an embodiment teacher. It's like I embody being that. And same when you meet anyone who's really integrous and passionate about what they do, it's at the level of being, it's at the level of who they are. And I, you know, I want to stress here that I'm not talking about how tall someone is or how fat someone is that's body and you know you could be very grounded and still have have no legs for example yeah so it's something a bit more subtle than body and there are certainly body prejudices which is not what i'm talking about you know we're all unconsciously embodied yeah so there's like a doing thing which is behavior so if you say somebody embodies compassion you would expect to see compassionate behaviors but then you say it goes deeper so who their being is compassion how would that like show up in the body like how would someone who embodies compassion apart from like watching what the they do, right? How would you see? I mean, this may be a question to which there's no answer. But anyway, so how would you see someone embodying something like compassion? Well, I'd, I'd put that out to anyone listening and just say, you already know the answer to this. If you see someone who is tight and moving in a jagged kind of movement pattern, and their breathing's contracted, and their face is contracted, and their belly's contracted, is that person likely to be compassionate? And we could say probably not. You know, I was, when I was younger, I used to kind of, I was brought up as a Christian. My mum actually was a nun before she met my dad. And I was always taught, you know, Jesus said, love thy neighbor. And I thought that sounds great. And my next question was how? And embodiment's the kind of, the one answer to that, you know, like there's like, what's the method for doing that, for being say more compassionate or a better leader? You know, you read a book on leadership, it's like be a better leader. It's like, well, how? So what's the methodology of change around that? As I was just saying before, we're all unconsciously embodied, right? So we all have a set of patterns, dispositions. You know, when you look at a human being, you look at history, you look at they're leaning in a certain direction, both literally and metaphorically in the sense that their certain behaviors are more available to them. Um, and that's your personality. That's your character, right? Like we all have that. And that forms for our experiences, you know, a lot of it when we're young, maybe some genetic component. And we have a certain kind of character, a certain leaning, and people see that in us. You know, like that's something that most of us have at least a pretty good felt sense for. And that's unconscious in most people. And, you know, if it's pretty interesting for most people to become aware of that. So to actually become aware of like, okay, I have a certain set of habits, certain leaning, and then I can change those either in the short term, like just state regulation. For me, you know, I'm so much more compassionate when I'm relaxed and happy, when I'm rushing and stressed and miserable, you know, maybe that's uh, just haven't had a good night's sleep. I'm just a lot less likely to be kind. And as someone who would like to be kind, you know, managing my state, both in terms of those biological things, but also it might just be in the moment just going, okay, let's take a breath before I respond to my wife or before I, you know, respond angrily to this email or whatever it is. You know, I can regulate myself in the moment. That's a skill. If you don't have that, you are a toddler. You have a president right now that has very bad self-regulation. And it's obvious that he's, you know, does things impulsively uh, without being able to regulate. And then maybe more unusually to people would be the longer t- How do we change ourselves over time? And that's where practice comes in. This idea that we develop ourselves over time, not through reading books, not through thinking about it, but through actually practicing developing ourselves. So you would say, I mean, there are three things in there I want to double click on. You would say that the personality has a bodily component, has a physical, like the physical shape that people are. Is the personality, is it just this thing that shows up on tests or it's not just whether you're an arsehole or whether you're kind or whatever like that? You say that all of that has a body. Give me an example. Like of a, a, what, would a, what would a body that was like a, an arsehole or no, I mean, that's a bad example. <laughs> well, let me give you some of the evidence base on this. So, I mean, this, yes, it comes from ancient wisdom and, you know, body therapy and things that aren't so psych- scientifically established, but there's, there's plenty of studies out there on this, like for, you know, extroverts swing their arms more. I mean, like Pixar animators know this. There happens to be a Pixar animator with the exact same name as me. And through an accident, we kind of were in contact. And it was quite interesting to chat to him, Mark Walsh, because basically in order to show the character in animation, 
they have to understand the movement patterns. You know, whether it's the inward roll of the shoulders or the inward point of the feet of the average introvert, you know, whether it's the arm swing of the average extrovert, you know, there's, there's all these kind of things. You know, culture is embodied in some way as personality. You know, there's a reason Brazilians move in a certain way. Now, what we have to be careful of here is it's not every individual in a culture and also that any particular thing can have multiple meanings. And it's, you know, like, why is, let's say you have outwardly rotated femurs, so your feet point kind of out. Does that mean that you're, you know, kind of V-shaped, you know, as you stand with your feet together, so the heels will be together and the toes will be apart. Like, do you sit that way simply because of the shape of your leg, your leg bones may be different from other people's, there's quite a lot of variance. Did you do ballet as a kid? Or are you extroverted? Like, they're all possibilities. And it's, it's key here that it's not so much just the gross physical things, as I said, but it's how we are in our bodies. So, you know, Stephen Hawking, for example, has an extremely animated embodiment. He's lively as anything. And that character is not only expressed through that, but created through that. This is what embodiment means. It's not just body language. We're creating our character moment by moment in this way of being, of posture, breathing, movement, not so much kind of shape or size. And that doesn't have to be limited by kind of physical limitations. You know, Stephen Hawkins, for example, can't actually physically move a whole lot, but he can move enough that it it's creating his way of being, that kind of lively, cheeky, sharp way of being. Sure. And it lives in his language and it lives in his, like, he's just animated. And, and you can always, when you're listening, just talking, you can always, like, hear the guy grinning. <laughs> even, you know, yeah, it's kind of right. funny. Like, even though it's coming through a computer, but certainly voice, yeah. voice is an expression of body, you know, like, this is... So let me think about this. So personality-wise, so so the bunched forehead or the knitted brow or the super tight jaw or the hunched shoulders or the rounded back or the gluteal muscles that are squeezed really, really tight. All of those have personality correlates. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And I think it's, it's, it's better to talk in terms of preferences, patterns, you know, we see correlates rather than hardcore, you know, getting into like, well, if you have this, it means that that's far too simplistic, as I said, because there's all these, all these different variables and different things. But you know, this, this idea of body reading, some people are very finely attuned at this. And some people, even in the field of embodiment, say, look, body reading doesn't really exist. It's not really a real thing. There's still people on that end of the spectrum, so, you know, from the black and white end to the it doesn't exist end. And, you know, most people in the field fall somewhere in the middle of saying, yeah, there's some validity to this. There's definitely some science behind some of these starting to be developed. But you don't believe me. Like, this is something you can try out. Like, you know, if you're listening to this, just listen to this with your head tilted back for five minutes and then listen to it with your head tilted forward for five minutes and see how you receive it differently. You know, uncross your arms or walk a little bit differently. If you're listening to this podcast, walking along the street, you know, see how that affects you to bring your awareness down to your feet or up to the top of your head. You know, these are all experiments. I really always say to my students, I don't believe a word I say, you can actually experience different embodiments. Right, right, right. Yeah. Try it for yourself. And this is, so this is interesting. So say that like, I'm like an angry dude. I mean, I, I yeah. have been in, in therapy for like, you know, I've, angry outbursts a couple of decades ago and uh, all of therapy happens through talk yeah what you're saying i think or the, the inference implication of what you're saying is that there are limits to the without addressing we can't ex- change our talk or change our attitudes or change our responses like i wanted to become less less explosive so we can't just hope the body follows along that we need to be thinking about the body as part of that reaction is that correct yeah well you i mean you could work through language through thought you know looking at maybe you're being very you know i've worked with angry people often very judgmental on themselves for example and you could no 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 (laughs) no, it doesn't bring any bells every single person i've worked with with anger is is harder on themselves than everyone else so you could work with the thought process however you can think of this as a coherence you know this is one organization i've worked with about the coherence of emotion body and language so yeah you could go in with language you could talk about it talking about emotions though is a little bit like dancing about architecture um you know because emotions are, <laughs> that's a they're, great they're, they're still that fast <laughs> oh, you know, where it comes from but what are emotions emotions are bodily actions you know like anger is done with the tense belly the tight jaw the contracted eyes and a forward moving angular and flush face flush face and all of that yeah yeah there's yeah. a physiological component and there's a, a morphological component if you want to put it that way yeah, right? absolutely and it's very hard to be angry while leaning back in your chair softening your belly softening your eyes softening your jaw 
because you just undid anger. This is one of Paul Linden's, one of my teachers, kind of big, big guys, um, big things is like anger as an action. We need to start thinking of emotions as actions we do in the body rather than sort of things that happen to us as if we were, you know, talk about somatic responsibility. And when someone says, you made me angry, for example, well, that's blatantly ridiculous because someone else could be in the same place with the same stimulus and not have the same emotional response. Like, let's say the music came on and you hated it and I loved it. Now, you know, music didn't make you angry and me happy. Like, we literally are the only ones who have, have, have that response. And as we get older, we can have some control over that. We're not two-year-olds. And we can certainly learn skills to really fine-tune that, you know, to regulate ourselves, to manage those patterns. That's one way to work somatically. There are other ways to work. You know, we might actually need to express our anger or express it, learn to express it in a safe, controlled way. You know, it might be about boundaries and learning to get a solid no in our body so we then don't have to overcompensate with anger. So, you know, there's a no posture we teach in body yoga principles, which is one of the methods I use. And you can, people can Google that. They can see my beautiful Ukrainian wife. I, I wondered for a while while it was the most popular video. I think I figured it out. <laughs> well, because, of, because of Daria. <laughs> Daria is demonstrating the posture. Yeah. And um, so that's no posture. You can see her do that on YouTube. And it's a way of, like, finding that no in the system but again like people reveal patterns you know someone i show one posture and we have 10 people in the class doing it in 10 different ways and some people are aggressive some people are passive some people are wide open some people are closed defensive you know like everyone's not making this is the beauty of form practice whether it's yoga or martial arts or whatever is you don't make mistakes you accidentally express yourself so form practices can be really useful for learning about those and then there's the freedom practices of like, you know, going crazy, fire rhythms, dancing and jumping around and, you know, we're just stretching and moving, rolling around your floor, you know, like actually letting the body express itself and move through the process of the body rather than just always controlling and regulating so you can turn it into a bit of a robot that way. And, you know, in therapy, you know, trauma work was where the body really re-entered therapy. There was a guy called Bezel van der Kolk who works in the States, but originally from the Netherlands, and he wrote a paper called, the, uh, the seminal paper called The Body Keeps the Score. So like trauma, like PTSD or, or sexual abuse. Exactly, yeah, sort of stuff, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, you know, yeah, I've worked in war zones. My main mentor works a lot with abuse recovery. And, you know, so I was informed of that. And he you know, basically talks that you can't talk your way out of trauma. It, you know, it's sometimes helpful to talk and be listened to. You know, empathy is a beautiful thing. But they realized that the trauma was held in the body and that you needed to do some work with the body. And there's things like somatic experiencing, Peter Levine. There's other somatic modalities, body modalities, somatic, just you can replace with embodied. And, you know, people realize that you can – just talking about it wasn't enough. We – and this is really indicative of... Well, hang on. Let me just stop you one sec. So what does it mean that trauma is held in the body for my listeners? What does that mean? Like PTSD or sexual... Like what does that mean to be held in the body? Yeah, yeah. So so if someone's come back from Afghanistan or they've had a trauma background, you'll see it in patterns of the body. So you'll either see, for example... Uh, hyper arousal so they're stuck in that fight flight response where they're you know it's the jumpy vietnam veteran kind of kind of stereotype you know or, or someone just can't sleep or can't concentrate you know like that hyper arousal they're in that body mode of being ready to fight or run away or well, they're in a freeze response where everything's a closed down and you know it might be like you know work in russia a lot and you'll see a lot of faces and jaws that are very tight you know, that's a kind of cultural trauma pattern almost. The Israelis I work there tend to have this hyper arousal that makes them very quick. So you might, you might see it like in, you know, in those kind of generalized patterns or, you know, it would be bands of what's called armoring, which are chronic muscular contraction that serves no obvious functionality. So, you know, I mean, this really shows embodiment. Like none of us stand or sit or walk in a way which would be biologically prescribed. Right, yeah. You know what I mean? Like if there was a, a computer model of how a human being walks, nobody fucking walks that way. Or like, how are you sitting or standing right now? I would just ask anyone as you're listening to this, it's probably not in the most sort of architecturally functional way. Yeah. Because yeah. its body is actually doing something else. It's Yes, it's supporting you physically. That's part of the body's job. But it's also creating you. It's also socially signaling. It's also regulating your moods. It's also, you know, an expression of all the everything that's ever happened to you in your life. So it's no wonder you're not standing, for example, with the middle of your foot lined up with the middle of your knee joint and the middle of your, so your hip socket, which would be the functionally the best way to stand just from a kind of architecture point of view 
nobody stands that way because because there's too much other stuff going on and that other stuff the body's role in perfection uh, perception cognition emotion social relations politics is what embodiment is make that list again that so what was that list like i'm i'm standing in a particular way what's ref, what's that reflective of at a deeper level reflective of and creating so it's a bi-directional link so body language creating as well um perception so how do you see the world and whether the cast of my eyes is down or up or my vision is narrowed or broad is that that sort of thing yeah my perception literally you're even more than that like literally your perception of the world like how did what do you notice and how do things seem is affected by your embodiment like we all know this right let's say you got well laid and then you went out for breakfast and all of a sudden you start noticing different things because you're happy and relaxed yeah like we've all been on holiday and wow like all of a sudden my oh, sh- world seems different wow i've never seen this I've never seen a sunset like that or that's the most beautiful woman yeah yeah, yeah. yeah everything's yeah. amazing when you're in love right it's like it's not it's not all you know it's like wow this is the best tasting coffee i've ever had it's like no you're just in love and every, your perception's changing you know that's great it's, you know it's a physiological thing your cognition and there's lots of studies on this there's a guy called the dance doctor peter lover at uh, hertfordshire university and he had people move in a square angular way. And he had another group of people move in a kind of crazy Californian way. And what he discovered was the first group got better at maths and the second group got better at um, creative problem solving. And that's simply as a result of getting them to move differently. That's wild. And we all have, yeah, we, like Stuart Hello is a big name in this field, says we move through space like we move through life. Yeah, we move through space like we move through life. And I would add to that, if we want to change our lives, we can also change how we move through space. So like, so is that like how the pace of walking and whether we're inclined forward or whether we're, we're thrown back on our heels or any, all that stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, real simple shit people can experiment with. Again, don't believe me. If you are like got a head full of thoughts racing at a thousand miles an hour, I'm a bit like that at the end of a week of work, you know, by walking slower or sitting back in your chair if you're sitting, you know, and if you're feeling a bit sluggish and you're kind of like, oh, I'm listening to this, I'm walking to work and I'm a bit, you know, actually push from the back foot, put your head up, walk a bit quicker. And it's, it's, it's real easy to change these things and to change your mood, to change your perception, emotion, just to come back to the list would be a big one. You know, the emotional emotion is kind of like the canvas our life is painted on. It's not just a sort of thing, occasional thing that happens. And the, the kind of disposition would be the longer term emotion, which we don't even feel. This is the scary thing. It's like the part of us that we've got so used to, like comfortable underpants or the taste of our own mouth with habituate. Yeah, yeah. Everybody else feels it. Like you have a certain voice pool, right? And in, in that voice, and if someone listens to five or six episodes of your podcast, they'll really feel it. Some people will feel it right away, but everyone will feel it after five, 10 podcast episodes. And some people will love it. Some people will hate it. And my experience of listening to podcasts is eventually the p- person's embodiment becomes unbearable and, and everyone gets annoying eventually, right? <laughs> Don't tell me that. I just started. <laughs> no, no, but it, it, it's like people would listen to a load and then they go, oh, this is great content. But there'll be something in your voice which reflects an embodiment which they may really like or they may not like, just intuitively, right? And that will be pace, language, tone, breathing. I mean, it'll be linguistic stuff, but it'll be a lot of the stuff that's created by the body because the, the vocal cords are the body. The lungs are part of the body and the jaw and the size of the mouth cavity and that makes all these sounds. That's all part of the body. So what you're saying is even speech, language is super embodied in a particular way, right? Sure. Like I worked a lot with interpreters and it's fascinating because I say something and the interpreter can completely ruin the message by changing the tone. So I'll say, right, everyone, welcome. And the translator in Russian will say, do, 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 do. <laughs> and it's like, okay, you just ruined my message. And another thing I All right. happens is I'll say so funny. I never thought I never thought of that I actually, have to right. Train there. my translators and my interpreters and embodiment, because otherwise they ruin it. The other one is uh, is a girl I work with really close and actually how I met my wife is actually an interpreter. I get very close when you do it that way. The other way is that sometimes I say something, the audience doesn't speak English, but they respond emotionally before the, the interpretation, the, the translation. Got it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So the body is responding to my body, and it's a really clean example. And you know, you hear this in the breath. Like every body mind system in the world works with breath, Paul. Like there isn't one that says the breath doesn't matter. And you know, v- basically, you're just ruining a breath every time you speak. Right? You're just just cutting into a breath, and you hear that in the breath. You know, is it the oh, like I was interviewing someone for my podcast a few weeks ago, and um, 
just here in their breath, there was a subtle sort of sigh, like, <sighs> yeah, you just kind of heard. And I knew this person after we, you know, stopped recording, even though they sounded quite upbeat in the call, there was this subtle flavor of sadness. And I, you know, I just said to them afterwards, are you, are you okay? And it turned out she'd just split with her partner and she was going for a tough patch with the politics there in the States. And, um, she just had the underlying sadness. Now that was that would would have been communicated emotionally to every single person who listened to that podcast. But I just had enough professional training to actually pick up on it consciously. Yeah, but they would pick up on it like we know. I mean, that one guy. I mean, I studied this stuff back back in the day. He said, you know, like horses when they're in the field together, they don't have the corner office and they don't have titles and everything like that. But they know who the alpha is. They know who the leader. The kind of there's a dog does, a child does. Yeah, it's real natural. It's real natural. Like. You know, like like in my single days, I'd stop a woman in the street and talk to her and say, hi, excuse me, I just thought you looked lovely. I want to say hi. And within half a second, she'd decide whether you were man enough for her. Yeah. Like it was an immediate right. emotional response. And she'd either be like, right, not interested. Or she'd be like, oh, great. Yeah, what, my name's Sarah. Nice to talk to you. <laughs> and that was an immediate emotional response that you didn't need to be trained in. You know, as I said, like a dog can tell if you're dominating it or it's dominating you. Like a child can tell if you're safe. Children have a very good sense of that. So these are... Yeah, but we tra- we probably train it out of them probably. So yeah, we get we have a cognitive culture and we get super cognitive. And of course, logic and, you know, the brain has got as many, many wonderful things. So I'm not going to be too hard on that. Western civilization is a good thing. However, there's sort of some of the downside is this kind of privileging of the cognitive over the emotional intuitive. Though I wonder if there's a sort of weird swing back that's happening now in, in kind of postmodern kind of West Coast style culture as well, where you know, feeling has become the new God and everybody's offended and it's all about how you feel and it's not about the facts, it's about feelings. You know, the swing back away from that, I think is equally, uh, equally dangerous. I'm obviously interested in that because part of, of course, my own project, if you will, is that we have to be more rational and more reasoned. Uh, and that, I don't think that necessarily means less emotional. I mean, I think you can, you're, allowed to have, you're allowed to have both. I mean, uh, emotions tell you what you care about. They tell you what's important in life. You can rationalize some of that, but you know, also there's a kind of deep level in which you know, compassion is predominantly, I think, an, an emotional and a relational phenomenon. It's not necessarily a rational thing. Altruism, justice, peace, compassion, you know, prosperity, all of these things are optimism pessimism, cynicism, they are all not just cognitive, of course, they're emotional as much as anything, which is why they're so important to leadership. Yeah, and the whole brain's not just, you know, nothing's just cognitive because, you know, even thinking is like visceral emotional process and um, values are deeply visceral emotion. So so even things like cognition, logic that might look disembodied or, you know, actually involve the body. And there's lo- like, look at Damasio, for example, there's loads of data on that now. Again, look at the science, you know, it makes sense. Yeah, no, I've actually, I've actually um, dabbled in some of the philosophy around this. Even some of the ways we learn mathematics, certainly begin to learn mathematics, are embodied. The body is involved. Even in some abstract thought, we'll have, a, in a sense, a, a kinesthetic a part of it. I don't recall precisely this research. This is a long time ago. I was dabbling in that. But they actually think that, you know, the the part of the, what the body's doing when it's remembering these abstractions is it's forming, if you want, bodily models, spatial models, morphological models in the in the brain. I didn't look too deeply because my head was baked, to tell you the truth, reading that stuff. I was like, well, let me just tell you a simple example of that. Sometimes I can't remember my PIN number, you know, for, what do you call it, a PIN number for the hole in the wall for getting cash out? But as soon as I'm in front of the machine, like my body knows where that number is. So it's like just the memory, right? That's just the thought, but it's an embodied memory. And, you know, like this is true of skill acquisition, which includes social skills and leadership skills, but even things that seem fairly abstract and cognitive have, have this embodied element. So I, I kind of like, like one of my teachers of colleagues says, you know, like wherever you go, there you are. So, you know, whatever you're doing, even if you're emailing, whatever on the phone, your body's involved. So then it becomes, what do we do with that? And I always say, you know, all I teach is awareness and choice. So it's become aware of what you're doing. Mindfulness, you know, mindfulness, embodiment is mindfulness based and then make some choices. You know, do I want to keep doing this now? And do I want to keep doing this for the rest of my life? Like that's basically it rather than being kind of monotonal or, you know, ha- being a hammer and everything looking like a nail. Yeah. That's what embodiment's about for me. It's about freedom. Choice, choice, choice follow, follows awareness. Is that, that's your, that's the message. Yeah. I think it's founding Christ that said that originally. And it's, it's, uh, it's every personal growth methodology out there. You know, like if you're working with thinking, it's the same thing. It's like, what am I thinking? Have to become aware of it, and then you can change it. So it's it's a pretty, you know, it's decent algorithm. And it's 
also in terms of just saying to people like, look, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not in a corrective model of the body. You know, you're standing wrong or something like that. I just say, look, notice what you're doing. There's consequences to that. Do you want to do that or try something else and build your range there? And, you know, nobody really minds having more options, right? You know, that's, that's the American dream. So it's you know, to have more freedom, to have more options. So that's generally the framing I have because it's, it's pretty workable for people. So two of the things I write about are leadership and change. So let's, let's get on to this. So let's talk first of all about all change, even change at the social system level, at the government level, at the policy level, at the global level. It's always got a personal aspect. There are also always human beings who are changing. How is your, you know, I don't want I was going to call it scholarship. I mean, there is obviously part of that, but how are your teachings or how are your methods useful to people who want to make important changes in their lives, you know, either habit changes or, or maybe change the way they interact with their kids or their spouse or you know, become better listeners or all the things that people want to change. How do we help with that in your discourse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the first thing to highlight is the body is itself a process of change. It's a verb and not a noun. So that's the first interesting thing. If we're going to look at this subject and we could probably think about that for a good couple of hours. So the body is a verb. The body is a happening. It's a process of, some, of something occurring rather than a thing, an object. That's that's Yeah, that's one of those statements that's kind of like at one level it's completely trivial, and the other level it's like, holy shit, that's profound, right? <laughs> yeah, the first time I, I said that out loud just in passing on one of my trainings. I'm not sure if I heard it somewhere else if I came up with it. And uh, then I kind of went away and thought about it for a year, you know, it blew my mind. <laughs> like, Whoa, I'm, I'm marking, I'm not Mark, you know, that's crazy. But that's more for the philosophers out there. Um, so something practical, Here, here's whatever you're trying to change, the body will undermine it because you have a set of habits, a body is a, an embodiment, means a, a partial solidification of a set of habits, Yeah. So whatever you're trying to change, and I, you know, For example, I gave up drinking years ago, you know, I was alcoholic and I had to quit and my body would just turn to go into the off license as I walked past one. It would like physically turn into one. And, you know, physiologically, I wasn't used to regulating myself without alcohol. I had all this energy and I couldn't sleep. And, you know, so I had to work with the body around that because if I didn't find some solutions to those things, I'd go back to the old solution. And, you know, also emotional, spiritual, there's different aspects to a good recovery. But uh, certainly involving the body would be one, you know, even if it's just getting some exercise and burning off that charge that you used to sedate with alcohol. You know, you, you have these patterns and the body will, the body just wins. You know, if you take your good intentions against bodily habits, right. your willpower will last long. That is such and, a great quote. I don't know, is that you, man? That's great. Your body just body wins. wins. Yeah, and, uh, when you know, there was a great teacher in this field, she said something similar. Which actually, I should give credit to different teachers. I mentioned Stuart Heller, Paul Lindham, my main teacher. Uh, Richard Strozzi Heckler, I think, is the giant in this field when it comes to leadership. You know, he's someone I think anyone can learn a lot from in this field, one of the real elders in this field. Paul Lindham, I mentioned. There's a few Stuart Heller, but uh, you know, this stuff isn't just coming from me. You know, There's a whole established field here of people working in this, and I've really built that community in Europe over the last 10 years. Uh, but yeah, for change you will be undermined unless you work with the body. And if you build, can build a body that supports the change, you know, it's going to work so much better. Yeah, that's cool. Well, I, you gave a shout out to Richard Strozzi Heckler. I actually studied with him for a good number of years, as more than a decade ago now. And my ex-wife actually is just doing his training, his big super embodied coach training. It's like 10 days of that. Yeah, I did a whole, a whole stack of it myself. But let's get back to... Let's get back to this business of change. I mean, I could use myself. I mean, every every year I set goals and every year I realize 90% of them, even if they're big fucking goals sometimes, you know, poker, or writing a book or, you know, getting married or having, you know, all, all, you know all, the, all the shit that makes my life happen. I'm very good at that. And then the one that, that, the one that stares at me every year, I was going to say it's the same every year, but it's not the same every year because it goes up by five kilos every year. So every every year it's like, you know, I'm 90 kilos. I want to be 85 by the end of the year. I'm 95 kilos. I'd like to be 90. I'm 100 kilos. I'd like to be 95. And that's something for me, which, you know, this is such so deep and so systemic or something like that. I've given up, right? I've just said, all right, fuck it. It's not going to happen. It doesn't matter how many times I go to the fucking gym. It's just not going to happen. I'm going to be the size that I am for the rest of my life. So how would a somatic or a bodily understanding help someone? Like, I believe the statistics are that 30%, no, it's more than that. It's much higher than that. 
Almost 40% of Americans are obese and almost 70% want to lose weight, I think. Yeah. And in any yeah, given, you guys are fat bastards. We are fat bastards. And in, in any year, I put on 10 kilos since I came to America. That's 22 pounds for Americans. Just because of the size of the portions and my inability to self-regulate. Let me jump in. So first of all, thank you for this. I feel like, you know, joking aside, I know this could be a really painful topic for a lot of people. And, you know, I'm hearing a little bit of pain beneath the sort of intellectual level i'm hearing some pain there for you for this uh, if that's fair to say so i really it is fair to say yeah 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 i really appreciate you bringing something real here and um, this is really live for me right now actually i had the same thing i was going around hotels and working around the world and i started to get this little pot belly and i was like you know what i don't want to be like a middle-aged fat guy you know i just it's not healthy it's not who i am it's not what i want to be and even though you know i believe in body being body positive and not kind of body shaming you know i think People may have listened to go, oh, he said fat bastard, you know, he's an awful human being. No, actually, I'm really not a body shamer in that way. And, you know, I think the first thing is to cut. Uh, so I'll tell you one correlate of my thing is that I am. And I mean, I don't mean this intentionally, but just the way I was raised is that the sorts of women and men that I find attractive, I'm a heterosexual, but but uh, something like that are very skinny, very thin, very fit. I'm not attracted to, I think I'm not attracted to myself at the current size. And that's part of it. That's part of the anger. And that's part of the shame. And that's part of the pain. Yeah, for sure. There's all these cycles. And so I've been really looking at this myself the last few months. We've actually got a course coming up on it. And so it's a great, you know, it's really in my learning zone. And actually, this was a bit of a blind spot for me around embodiment. You know, I'd looked at embodiment from all these extreme angles of martial arts and dance and working in wars and all this stuff. But I hadn't, you know, I wasn't being so aware of like, am I eating when I'm not hungry? So first of all, just that, you know, and that was a blind spot for me, but like most people in the embodiment field are less blind around that. And it, just being aware of like, okay, right now in my body, I'm hungry or I'm not. So I'm going to stop eating. Like that's one thing I'm going to keep going. Cause there's lots here. The other thing is here around to self forgiveness, you know, it's partly the environment we're in that makes it pretty difficult. Ob- obesogenic it's called by people who are specialists, obesogenic environment. The portion can, you know, sizes in the States, for example, be an example of that. The alcohol consumption in the UK and there's, there's all kinds of cultural factors. So the first thing is like, okay, noticing like, all right, okay, actually right now I'm lonely, like, or right now in my body, I feel kind of sad. And this is what's driving my eating. So I feel like there's a mindfulness component of just noticing what's really going in on in our body before we eat. Yeah. And also afterwards, like some sense of actually being with like, wow, I ate too much and actually like being sated sated or not sated, uh, over sated, whatever. Yeah. Before, during and after eating, like being present with that. I, I suspect most eating is emotionally driven. So having a rich emotional life is a key part of it. There's someone I really recommend called Charles Eisenstein on this. And there's a, 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 a mostly female group in the UK beyond chocolate. And they look at this kind of no diet model, which is not kind of restricting yourself, but actually feeling into the body and being like, okay, what do I really want to eat? And rather than going with cravings, it's like, there's another level of like, actually, this is what would be satisfying for me right now. And this is, you know, as I said, just little things like stop eating when you're full, you know, like I'm currently losing weight mostly through stop eating when I'm full and not emotionally eating, you know, for me, they were the key drivers, but then you look at it and it becomes very holistic. Like I found I was overworking and I was rewarding myself with food. And what was actually needed was to come into the embodiment of rest and self-kindness because you can get into these vicious spirals like any addiction of, you know, I'm hating myself and I'm in that body of like shame and guilt, that twist to turn away of shame and guilt. I'm in that body of despair or maybe anger and I'm getting into a sort of self-loathing embodiment. The thoughts are coming with that. And that is then making me eat more because I feel like shit. And that's a really good way of feeling good really quick. Um, you know, that's the addictive cycle with many things. And actually going, okay, can I self-regulate? There's a form of centering, which is this self-regulation, which is around dealing with pressure and stress. But there's another form, which is about dealing with grasping, like what do you want? And this is something I think I've been fairly innovative if Most of the martial arts-based teachers don't work with this because martial arts aren't about that. So this is where like, I notice myself literally get off center and get tight and you know I come off balance maybe it's like I'm reaching for the chocolate in the shop and then I just come back onto my heels I breathe I give myself a little bit of self-love I reconnect with my values and it becomes so much easier to walk past the chocolate aisle you know so what I'm hearing for, for first of all there's a lot of choice in this right there's a choice 
There's a mindfulness, so to be aware of uh, our emotional dispositions, to be aware of sated or not sated, to be aware of, you know, how our, I guess you're talking about a little bit like our somatic relationship to food, like grasping or or shoving food in your mouth mm-hmm. or what, whatever the, yeah, all, all of that. Again, really super holistically, of course. It's also pleasure, you know, like if you kind of say, for example, spend time in Italy, it's a real pleasure culture. Um, but people really enjoy food and it's something about actually really enjoying food rather than the sort of slightly Calvinist North European style, which we have around sex too, of really enjoying it. So there's an emotional and aesthetic satiation that comes from actually eating less because there's like a full rich, you know, the first time I saw my then Brazilian girlfriend eat a mango and my mother was visiting and you know, the juice is like running down her breasts and she's like groaning, groaning <laughs> everything a red blooded man would imagine. You know, I was like, wow, that's a girl enjoying a piece of fruit. I have never seen that before because English girls do not enjoy fruit that way. You know, she was just in the just like head back. Yeah, sort of, <laughs> sort of swimming in the goddamn thing, right? Yeah, just <laughs> loving the pleasure of it. So it's like, that's a full embodied experience of that piece of food and she's going to get satisfied much more easily and this also applies to other things i i I dare i dare say so um this kind of an exciting 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 image in my head right now mate you've done i thought i'd put it with that paul if if you like (laughs) it was a good six months of brazil living above a nightclub and doing aikido every day and working in the favela slums with kids it was a very interesting six months Um, but it was certainly an education in pleasure even in environments where people were quite poor and you know quite violent there was certainly the brazilians as a culture can often do pleasure very well so i feel like that's part of it is pleasure self-regulation the emotional side of things is absolutely huge and i to me that stuff's so much more effective than saying okay don't eat these foods because they get then i guess the question becomes how you know like you can like you're a super smart guy paul but you've you know you've failed year on and year out in this 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 intention exactly. to lose weight and I know more about fucking nutrition and biochemistry. Than, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I know shit. And, you know, that sort of stuff can help. It's like, okay, I need to eat some protein so I feel full. And, you know, if I, you know, have this, it's going to go to sugar real quick. And then, you know, so that kind of stuff can help a bit. But for me, it was just like I saw too many smart people putting on weight who'd read all the books. And, you know, if diets work, then just be one of them, right? And it's like actually different people need different things. And this approach of really looking at the emotional domain you know, actually, sometimes it's because it's we're lonely. You know, we're in this kind of like disembodied, disconnected, lonely culture, and food's just a way of kind of reconnecting. And I notice when I travel, I eat so much more shit. And when I'm like at home with Daria and I'm just loved up, I just eat so much That's better. So interesting too. And it's it's like, well, why is that? It's about love. It's not really about you know. It's about stress levels. It's about so much more. We don't think of that. We don't think of our relationship with food as part of our systemic. So part of loneliness or part of how connected we are to community or how satisfied we are in our work. Because the feeling of satisfaction or sated is an embodied phenomenon. So if we're super satisfied in our work, then some of those other hungers that might translate into overeating or something like that will be manifest in eating. Is that is that partly what you're saying there? It's a huge systemic. Yeah, exactly. It's like looking at all the different needs that you're trying to meet that way. And that's the long journey, I think, with food. You know, And I, I think because our culture is so obsessed with food, which is a real fall of empire type thing, and it's a real sign of kind of spoiled brats that we are. And I, I feel like this is the way into depth through food to really open up depth through this topic rather than it just being sort of a middle class kind of obsession as a way of you know food for so many people has all these meanings like it's a way of proving you're better than other people you well, know it's like wine i got that with wine too you know i i, I mean when i was a, a young investment banker i couldn't tell the difference between a 1950 54 chateau lafitte rothschild and a and a freaking bottle of beaujolais i like, probably could that but that's pretty Dream, but you know, but something, but it was all part of my identity and part of my image and everything like that. And I'm the sort of geezer that could afford the most expensive bottle of wine in the shop, so I'm going to have that. I mean, a lot of it really comes down to kind of self love and self kindness. I know that can be a kind of cliche and you know, said with a kind of breathy Californian voice, it might be, but uh, I really feel like a lot of this stuff comes down to that. It's like really tuning into that deep desire to, to take care of yourself. And it's the same with any kind of resolution or whatever, it's like, where is this coming from? You know, like, do I really want this? Is this deeply coming from deep inside, deeply connected with my values? 
you know, what's driving the other side, you know, what's that about? So yeah, like I hope that helps and the body is just one way to work with this, but uh, it's been pretty useful to me. And uh, as I said, there's whole systems out there like Charles Eisenstein stuff that are based on this. So it's, um, you know, I'm actually, I actually, I actually don't know them. I don't, funnily enough, I don't know him. I know Lyndon and I know some of the other geeks you talked like about. Him, like Charles, he's really deep. And he talks about society and capitalism and, you know, it's a real real deep guy. So I have a selfish interest, which is, you know, you've kind of, I did a shit ton of this about 10 or 15 years ago and and I've left a lot of it behind and a lot of the practices. I was a yogi for a long, for a long time, but I haven't done that very, so you piqued my selfish interest in how I can use this to, you know, work with things I work with. I work with mild depression. I work with overeating and stuff like that. You know, I work, I'm, I'm single and I prefer not to be, you know, there's lots of, there's lots of things. So I've, I've helped a lot of people with that. I've, you know, worked with gay community on that. I've done workshops of attraction. That's a really fun way to play with embodiment as well. Cause that's, that's well, all- I just, uh, yeah, you know, I, right now my thing is I wouldn't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member, if you know what I mean. So when I go, get into a dating scenario, the women who are D7 and they're likely American and they're likely like super duper heavy. And that's, you know, that's part of my, if you want to, be, to put it extremely, my own self hatred is I just can't be around people yeah, who are my age or my weight. So they're, so, you know, I've, I'm playing a game I can't win, at least under the rules I've created for myself in that area. You want the good news? What's that, mate? <laughs> Like the lack of confidence created by the embodiment of the, the lack of confidence created by that self hatred, that's the thing I really don't like. So it's like like you can be proper fat and have lots and lots of women. That's not the key issue with attraction, but the the self loathing that's coming off that the lack yeah, how attracted I am to myself or how attractive I find myself. Yeah, you will smell that a mile off, and that lack of kind of confidence, which might be quite deep inside, it might not be on the surface because you know you're a consultant, you know how to stand up in front of groups and do your thing. You know that that kind of self love issue and the stuff around confidence. That's like the, you know whenever I've worked with groups of women, I say around the world, I say what's the most attractive thing in a man? Confidence is the the first thing they say. Well, it's funny. It's funny because people would say who haven't you know contact with me and at some deep level when I talk about the world of ideas, I'm super duper confident. And then you know we're, we picked out a domain in where at some level I smell of lack of confidence. You know they could smell fear. <laughs> 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 Yeah, well, passion is another big one, right? Like you're attractive when you talk about what you love and like that's that's a big one. And, there's, you know, there's all these domains that we struggle with. And, you know, again, just being a little bit kind to ourselves, you know, it's like it's normally like I find myself overworking at the moment. That's my kind of challenge at the moment. And the food stuff is kind of getting uncontrolled. It's like, right, point of focus is just working a bit hard. And a lot of it just comes back to like, why am I brutalizing myself? You know what I mean? Like, this is mean. Yeah, so it's such a quick way, but it just seems that so much comes back to that. I'm getting soft in old age. Very cool. Well, listen, I, that was my selfish interest, and I might explore that to you in a kind of call a little bit later, how I would get back into some of this stuff myself at a really, like, practical level. But I want to talk about you. <laughs> well, just anyone out there just to jump in before the last one. My favorite subject, mate. <laughs> I want to talk about you just because I want people to know, you know, we've talked, like, uh, you know, at 50 minutes about this right now. And I want people to know where they can find you, the sort of projects you're involved in. I want them to know a little bit about the history because, you know, we've spoken and we've yucked it up like a couple of guys and jollied around and stuff like that. But you actually work in freaking war zones and you work in Israel, Palestine, you work in Ukraine, you work in Russia, you've worked in Latin America, you know, you've worked all over the world making a difference in this stuff. So we've been kind of jollying along. I want people to know that. And I want people, this is, uh, I guess, the part where I say, you know, let it rip, baby. Blow your horn. What are you up to and where can people find you? Oh, well, I'm, we're British. We're not very good at that. I learned that from my American friends, though. Um, so, <laughs> okay. I mean, I spread my time between different projects. And I, I'd say to anyone out there interested in embodiment, the first thing is just do an embodied practice. Like, you don't have to pay me any money. Just go to yoga, go to dance, do some martial arts, whatever works for you, whatever suits your body and your circumstance. That's the first thing I'd really recommend everyone do. And, you know, I've got rich background in many of these things myself, but I'm kind of not snobby about it. It's like, just do something with your body, you know, any awareness-based body practice. And I still have my strong embody practice myself, Aikido, yoga. You know, I spent several years as an Aikido student, full-time studying martial arts, you know, as a live-in student, which is quite rare. Um, these days, I, I work with yogis a lot. So anyone that does yoga, I'd recommend to check out Embodied Yoga Principles. So that's Embodied Yoga Principles. Loads of free videos on YouTube. And you can look at Yoga in Daily Life channel or just Google. And, and 8 million followers or 8 million hits, right? So, now, yeah, so, so for listeners of all the people I've spoken to, Mark has got... 
he's he's a pretty modest dude. So, but he's he's got the largest social media following of anybody I know personally. Yeah, it's, it's got pretty big. It's kind of crazy. Some of them, you know, like it's kind of just. I just got in there early with the internet, and I was generous and put stuff out there, and you know, it's actually ended up being great marketing in a kind of roundabout way. I wasn't expecting. I get invited all over the world because people watch these videos. So there's lots on YouTube about embodiment. If you just put embodiment in, what is embodiment or embodiment and leadership or stress or whatever you're in attraction, you know, whatever you're interested in, you can find those videos. Um, if you're a professional like Paul, you know, and you want to kind of train in this stuff, we do something called the Embodied Facilitator course. Uh, we run that in Moscow. We run that in the UK, France. And uh, that's more, I don't say too much about that because i know most people listening to this aren't kind of facilitators or coaches but for those who you know are in that kind of professional domain that's the sort of deep dive course uh, if you want to really get into this stuff if how long is efc uh, efc is, is spread over about eight months so we have coursework and pre-work and intensives and you know e-learning and we'd have to come to the uk and france for about a week each this is about a year-long course and you know we've been doing that this is our sixth year doing it in, in the uk and our fourth year in russia um this is a pretty comprehensive course and what makes it a bit different is we have all different perspectives there so there's multi it's not like one guru it's not just me you know it's like multiple perspectives multiple ways of looking at it finding creative ways to work with it and if you're a like a body person who wants to work in business which is where i spend a lot of my time working in big business that's a great way to transition. And if you're like a business person or a coach who wants to work with the body, then it's just super practical. We can help you do that safely and creatively. So EFC is the kind of main course. And then we do, you know, I do business training. It's my third hat. So yeah, I was with Ikea recently. I've worked with Unilever, L'Oreal. I just sent a contract to a Russian company for a ridiculous amount of money, which funds all the charity stuff. And uh, that's the corporate work where it's like leadership or stress management work. So they're, they're really different hats. And sometimes I'm in yoga pants and sometimes I'm in a suit, but they're all basically the same thing. I don't do much work in areas of conflict anymore, but usually once a year or something like that, I'll um, take a holiday in inverted commas somewhere interesting. And I, I've worked with a lot of humanitarian aid work. Holiday and work with traumatized people in war zones. That's a nice Well, like I met my wife in the Ukraine, you know, so it's like I can't complain. You know, I was working in the war there and she was my interpreter and I had great times in the Middle East and um, Afghanistan was colorful and the slums of Brazil and Ethiopia and, you know, Sierra Leone. Like, well, tell uh, us about one or two of those things, mate, because I want people to, you know, partly like have a, a relationship, a connection with you. So I know you don't like to toot, toot your horn, so toot your horn a little bit here, mate. Like, what were you up to in these crazy freaking places doing this crazy funk and Cali <laughs> this Californian stuff, man? Like, what, what? how is that useful to people who are traumatized by war day in and day out? I mean, for a few years, I was just adventuring and going interesting places and getting involved with sort of Aikido-related projects and peace-building projects, for example. There's something called Embodied Peace Building, which you can look up if, that, if you're kind of a hippie and that's your thing. Paul Linden pioneered that and I took it forward. So I've done some peace building work. Like I was in Northern Ireland not long ago, which was a real dream for me, you know, because it's like my family are Anglo Irish and I'm in the barracks that, you know, my uncle was a soldier in and the other side of the family might have been throwing rocks at. And, uh, you know, did some embodied, what's called embodied peace building work there recently, which was beautiful, really, really touching job. And yeah, you know, I've, I've done other stuff, teaching trauma awareness a lot, just resilience work, like with aid workers, helping them not go crazy, basically using the embodied tools so they can be a bit more robust when they're helping people because there's, there's high levels of addiction and trauma and things like that in the average refugee camp. So yeah, I've done those sort of things. And sometimes it's just leadership programs, you know, like, like I'm working with the gay community a lot in Moscow, which is a pretty uh, a group that's had been through some hard stuff. They're really oppressed right now with this current regime, are they? aren't they? Yeah, it's getting a bit better, but it's just been pretty bad. I've been working with them for three years. My best friend out there is a, is a lesbian girl. And, you know, they bring me in. I've done workshops on just fun stuff like attraction. And we do like management skills just to help them manage their projects better you know or our leaderships we're doing one on money next time i'm there it's like the embodiment of money because that community has a lot of issues as do many alternative communities around money and how we embody aspects of that um our relationship to that you know like you know being poor is spiritual kind of thing so i'm doing a workshop with them on money just to help their projects along so sometimes it's kind of real practical and a lot of the time it's been trauma and things like that i mean it's the more colorful of what i do but you know most of my days i'm teaching yoga teachers to be more you know work more psychologically i'm teaching business people to be better leaders i'm teaching life coaches some practical tools you know so i don't want to speak too much about the sort of colorful stuff interesting as it is okay well i mean i think you know it's part of what defines you so i just wanted people to sort of 
have a relationship with you and have our listeners have a relationship with you and embodied yoga. So that's about teaching yoga teachers, not to just be putting people in poses. Uh, it's about teaching. <laughs> it's about going the other way. Like if I was a psychotherapist, you might teach me bodily practices so I can incorporate that in my talk therapy. You're teaching yoga people who work with the body to work with narrative and with you know, all personality. What I realized a few years ago is that yoga is the biggest cycle uh, embodied practice in the world. It's bigger than all the others combined in terms of the number of people doing it. And I just realized that yoga had become a little bit like body, beautiful consumerist or hippy dippy, silly kind of new age. And you think that's a bad thing. I think that's a good thing. You know, I think that's the spread of yoga, but you think that's a kind of an abomination, don't you? you know. no, no, I think yoga spreading is generally a good thing. Now I think of it as a good thing, but I went for a stage of just feeling like its heart had been ripped out. And um, what I realized was there was a real gap there, niche, if you will, for a way of doing yoga, which was psychologically rich without being esoteric and Eastern. Yeah, and yeah. I've got nothing against exercise and I've got nothing against, you know, I'm a Buddhist, I've got nothing against Eastern disciplines, of course. But I realized there was, a, we could use yoga in a way which was, you know, helping people with their confidence issues. Like I got an email a few days ago and it was from a student of mine who said, I did your embodied yoga workshop and I learned to say no and I learned confidence and I learned to embody that and I got out of an abusive relationship. And for the first time in my adult life, I'm not being hit on a regular basis. Holy shit, you know? right? And I was like, whoa, goosebumps, you know? Like, like this person had learned in a fairly short space of time how to have the embodiment of being able to say no and walk away. And, you know, she credited that to the embodied yoga. Now, now, yeah, stretching your hamstrings and strengthening your quadriceps is important, but it's not important like that. And it just it just strikes me that there's a... <laughs> what an understatement, right? You know, like the body beauty, it's not important, like I'm not being hit every day. Right. I mean, that's just a kind of modest way of putting something that's life-altering, right? Yeah, right. And it's sometimes people, it's not, you know, they're going to get hit or whatever, but it's just like, you know, it's about confidence or... You know, like the Russian girl I was working with, she said like, oh, you know, I really want the autograph of my favorite pop star. And I just had to, I did a little bit of embodied yoga and then I was able to walk up to them and talk to them. And I was so nervous, but I managed it. And, you know, it could just be a little thing like that. It's certainly useful in relationships. We explore a lot of relationships in embodied yoga because, you know, life's about relationships. It's not about you on your yoga mat on your own. And it's just fun as well. It's social. We bring a lot of stuff in. It's a whole new way of doing yoga. It's really like genuinely, it's different enough that some of the yoga establishment hate me because it's really quite different. But it is still yoga. Yeah, really. well, whatever. As Taylor Swift says, haters going to hate, hate, hate. Haters going to hate. First they laugh at you, then, they, then they're angry with you, then they join you. So that's cool. And, and what about out here in America? So are there embodied yoga people who you, you know, trust and respect? Or do you have students we have one perfectly with perfect dentistry called Jamie, who's an American who um, trained with me in England and who's started to do some work out there. Boulder or, or Cali or where? No, she travels around, but mostly the Midwest. And um, I know there's interest. To, uh, it won't be long till there's schools across the States. At the moment, we're in Russia, Sweden, France, Ireland, Spain, you know, all across Europe. Um, it's kind of spreading around the world. So I haven't particularly wanted to go there a lot. But if students from there want to come to any of our teacher trainings and have a nice time in Belfast or Stockholm or Moscow or London, then they're very welcome to to come on over. I feel like that would be the next place that kind of catches on. Well, yeah, Boulder's, uh, Boulder's only an hour from me. So uh, that's pretty fertile. It would go down pretty well in Boulder. I like Boulder. It would go down pretty well there. I know there's been some interest from there. It's just, uh, you know, it's a big hop for people to come over to the UK. <laughs> yeah. And while a lot of the people, she said, one of the things that you do amazingly, I should probably talk, I could probably talk to you for another hour. But anyway, but a lot of the people in your who are attracted to you or people who are from the new age discipline. And it's something that you could be quite caustic and dismissive of because a lot of the yogis, a lot of the spiritual people and a lot of the people who work at peace and social justice and all of that kind of stuff. And all of the people who are coaches and facilitators in business, all of that, they're all like super duper spiritual as my friend says in inverted commas uh, and stuff like that. But you're, uh, well, I don't even know if I want to get into the bad Buddhist stuff right now, but it's interesting in that community because you think there's a disembodied aspect to all of that. I'm oh so I'm more more spiritual than thou type of thing. Is it trying to transcend the body and get out of reality? I feel like it's just a matter of development. There's definitely a big group of people who have gone through, you know, they've been spiritual, maybe they've been broke or they've gone through kind of being snobby about it and they kind of come out the other side and they're looking for something which is deep but has a kind of grounded kind of real quality to it. 
and you know, I'm provocative and I use a lot of Anglo Irish humor and it's not everyone's cup of tea, but you know, you don't need to be everyone's cup of tea. You know, there's, there's a good amount of people that like that. So, um, I just feel like I need to go fairly soon. Actually, I actually need to wrap up. So I just feel like what I do is I, I love embodiment. I put it out there to anyone that was interested in it in different formats. And I, you know, be myself doing that. And uh, it seems like over the years that there's been enough people be interested in that, that, you know, I'm st- still in business. I just don't have to get a proper job, Paul, which still uh, astounds me. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you. I know we're at an hour now and I know you have some stuff to do. Uh, so I'm deeply appreciative of you and the work you do and you spending an hour here. And it's kind of cool. It's, an, it's so different than anything I've done on this podcast so far. Um, but I found some personal inspiration and I'm just very grateful to you, mate. Paul, it's a real, real pleasure. You're always welcome with mine and Darius. If we ever out here, we might end on our world tour. We're having a summer. I'm having a summer sabbatical. We, my wife wants to uh, play some poker, so we might, we might swing by so she can play some poker with you. I'll be in Vegas and I'll, I'll put you guys up. That, that is not a bad idea. Maybe we'll meet up in Vegas. That could be fun for the World Series. Paul, I need to run. I've got to get a train to London. So you take care, mate. All right. Thank you so much for having me on today. Peace. Bye bye. Yes. Bye. And now we have a cool part of the show, my favorite part, well, for all my favorite parts. I'm going to talk about three books that are very exciting. The first one is Steven Pinker's new book, and we've got Steven coming on the show just shortly. Now, his new book is called Enlightenment Now, The Case for Reason, Science, Humanism, and Progress. I'm a big fan of Professor Pinker, and uh, he and I are going to have a very robust discussion about his new book. I'm particularly passionate about the Enlightenment topic, so we have two other podcasts coming up in the Enlightenment sometime in the summer, probably, from the former editor of The Economist and a philosopher from the University of California. But let's uh, let's focus now. We're going to have Stephen Pinker on the show. Uh, there's a link to his new book, Enlightenment Now, in the show notes. One person who really powerfully influenced my own writing and thinking uh, when I wrote The Science of Organizational Change is a professor called Scott Lillianfeld, and he's written two books that I just think are absolutely outstanding. Um, almost, you know, if you are uh, follow popular psychology or even professional psychology, life-changing. One is called The Great Myths of Popular Psychology, and he has about 50 of those. And some of these things we take for granted, some of them are folk wisdom. Some of these are actually passed around by psychologists as truths. And he debunks them with evidence in a way that I think you'll find really enlightening. He also has a great book called Brainwashed, The Seductive Appeal of Mindless Neuroscience. You know, uh, someone said if Andy Warhol was alive today, Andy Warhol would um, be painting brain scans and not Campbell Soup cans, which I thought was kind of interesting. So it's very uh, fashionable to put in an article on psychology, a picture of a brain scan because it makes you look very clever and they they are beautiful, let's face it. But how much does neuroscience really help us understand mind and behavior at the macro concerns with which we're capable of? I've even heard people talk about when you coach someone, you want to target their amygdala, which is nonsense, even though there is an amygdala and it has some important things to do. The idea of a coach talking to someone targeting it is pure bizarreness. But anyway, I'm going to recommend those three books. Got two of Scott Lillianfeld's books and one of uh, Stephen Pinker's books. And there are links in the show notes. They're really, really sort of, from my point of view, life-changing books. So I, I recommend them heartily to you. Thank you. To celebrate the launch of the show, and thank you all for listening, I'm going to be giving away books. Lots and lots of books. All you have to do is leave a review in iTunes. We're going to raffle off a book every single week for 12 weeks. So head on over to paulgivens.net slash iTunes to get easy to follow directions and let me know the title of your review to make sure that you're entered to win. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Think Bigger, Think Better. Great ideas are great, but this isn't gospel. Share your critical thinking in the comments. Where do I disagree? What insights were most powerful? If you got value, don't forget to share the value by sharing the podcast. Finally, to get information on book and blog releases and new video content, head over to paulgibbons.net and join the community of thinkers talking about using science and philosophy to make our world a better place.